Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Redeeming Grace Church. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Man, every Sunday is just a different kind of collection of people every Sunday, uh, but we're grateful that you're here with us today. Hopefully, uh, you grabbed one of these bulletins on the way in. Uh, they were on the table back there. I'm not sure we had anybody handing them out. If, if somebody wants to hand those out, Kathy's going to take care of us. That's great. So you just got an order of service in there. We just try to think through the flow of our songs and our prayers um, together that, that kind of fits with the message. So you can see that there. We've got kids, um, kids ministry. We've got nursery for birth through age two. So if you've got one of those kids, we've, we have some people back there that are happy to care for them during the service. You're always welcome to keep them in here, but that is available to you. And then uh, partway through the service, kids ages three through kindergarten have the opportunity to go back and do some activities back there as well. So uh, just know that that's available to you. Uh, on the back side, is a bunch of stuff that's going on in the life of our church, some ministry stuff, some things going on this week. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to go up to North Middle School. Anybody that wants to join us and just pray for North Middle School, uh, Carrie teaches there. She's right back here at this table. Carrie teaches there. I've got one kid there. I've had two kids go through there. And uh, we just thought it would be great to go and just pray for the staff, students, and families there. And then also we're going to do a couple work days this Wednesday and this Saturday. Uh, if you're able to, during the week or this weekend, come. We've got some rooms we want to paint. We've got some things we want to organize. And so uh, you don't have to come for the whole time, but you can see some information on there. We'll just have a list of things as we continue to settle into this home that God has provided for us. So. Um, we've been working on a memory verse together as we go through 1 Peter, and so this is the one for November. Would you read this together with me? Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. That's a great theme for November and a theme of our messages through November as we work through 1 Peter. Um, I think that's it in terms of announcements. Oh, I, just, I did want to let you know that we do have these connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, there's prayer on one side, so if you've got something we can pray for, we would love to do that. If uh, you'd like to get connected in some way, get on our email and text list. Um, we try not to spam too much, uh, but I would like to follow up with you if I can. And so if you haven't filled out one of those yet, um, there's a box in the back to put those in. And uh, we just want to make sure that, uh, that you know about that. Okay, if you'd please stand, our call to worship today comes from Psalms chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. We want to start each service and end each service with Scripture. And so here is our call to worship together. Psalm 18, 1 through 3. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from all my enemies. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we, do, we love you. You are our strength. You are our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our shield and our salvation, our stronghold. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of us spending this time gathered here to worship your name. We pray that from the heart we would worship you in spirit and in truth. May you be pleased with the gathering of your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing.
Old Testament reading for today is from Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 12. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and they, there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, and he was put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his land, hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now we're going to move into our time of our prayer of confession. Um, I'm going to give you all a couple minutes here to prepare your hearts to receive the word from Josh and to, um, to take communion. Father, thank you that you love us, that you listen to our prayers. We know that you saved us so that we would be holy, obedient children. Um, but God, we confess that we've had hard hearts, we've sinned. I pray that um, you would forgive us as you have promised to forgive us when we sin. Father, you, you accomplished this forgiveness by your son, Jesus. Now we know that, that no matter what, 
we're yours. We hold to that promise. We hold to the promise that everyone who um, confesses their sins to you is forgiven, God. Um, thank you that it's you that make us holy and that you, you gave us your Holy Spirit to, to secure this. God, I pray that you would guard us, that you'd keep us in your name, help us to live as obedient children with hearts sensitive to you, to what you want us to do, walking in the paths you prepare beforehand for us. God, pray that you would keep us far from temptation, from every avenue. Um, thank you that you see us and that you know us and that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. things of earth 
seated. In this time in our service, um, we just want to lift up the things on our hearts and on our minds, um, trusting that uh, God is sovereign over every situation. And so um, if you'll bow in prayer with me and uh, lift up your request to God and yeah, let's go to God together. Oh God, um, thank you that you hear us and that everything that is on um, every mind in this room, um, you know about before we even bring them to you and uh, you care about them. Um, you feel sorrow for the things that we feel sorrow about and um, we rejoice in things that are good, and so thank you that you care, that you want us to bring these requests to you, God. Um, I pray for uh, medical procedures that um, are upcoming for several uh, members of our church. Um, in particular, I pray for um, Annetta and her upcoming uh, ankle surgery. Um, please be with uh, the surgeons who will be performing that operation. Um, I pray that the process could be speedy and that it could be as painless as possible for Aneta. Um, I also pray that the recovery time afterward could be short and that you would help us as a church to come alongside her and to be a family to her and help her through that uh, difficult and maybe painful uh, recovery process. Um, help us to be there for her, Lord. and. I also pray for Kathy and her upcoming um, cataract surgery. I uh, pray that that could be scheduled soon and that you would be with that process and help it to go well and let her eyesight be much better after that's finished. Um, we pray that there would be no uh, complications or fears um, in Kathy's mind, but help her to trust you and um, let that entire process be smooth and, and successful, please, God. I also want to pray for um, new members of our church and people visiting for the first time this morning. Um, I pray that Redeeming Grace Church could be a place where people can um, come and strengthen their relationship with you, God, and where people can feel like they have a family. Um, help us to be welcoming and uplifting of um, the body of Christ in Rapid City and our community. Um, and pray that people would take steps to uh, join churches where your word is faithfully preached and where you are worshipped. And we pray that we would always be um, honoring to you in how we do that here at our church. God, 
I also want to pray for um, our country, the United States. Um, I pray for the new administration that was just voted in uh, this last week. Um, please give them uh, wisdom and safety to the newly elected officials, um, as well as those who are transitioning out of office. Um, God, you are able to work through every type of governmental system and every person who is elected into power. Uh, you are able to accomplish your will and to bring good through um, all of them. And so we ask that uh, you please uh, bring good in extra measure to our country um, in these next four years. Please bring um, peace and bring an end to division in our country and in conflicts outside of our country. Uh, we ask that you would bring um, peace and uh, well-being to this country and to the world. And we pray that you would use your church to shine brightly into times of complete darkness and difficulty throughout the world pray that your church would be a beacon of light and hope into those places and that we would be the hands and feet of Christ and go willingly to seek out needs and to help wherever we can. Um, please fill us with the fruit of righteousness so that your name could be glorified on earth in your church and please bring more and more people um, to know you and to worship you. Um, and to have a relationship with you. And God, we bring these requests to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so kids age three through kindergarten, you can head back to Children's Church if you want. And if the rest of you would just stand and take just a quick moment to greet somebody nearby, we, uh, there's a Bible verse that says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's just do that right now. Meet someone you haven't met yet. And, uh, and I'll call us back together in a second. All right, you can head back to your seats, that's enough being nice to each other. All right, well we're in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25 today, it's page 12. 38. If, those, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, we have a copy for you. It's right in the seat backs in front of you. It's on page 1238. We're working through the book of 1 Peter, and we're calling our series Hopeful Exiles. What does it look like to live in a world that doesn't feel like home? Because we belong to God, we're headed to a new place. We don't fit here um, like we used to, and that's okay. That's actually what God intends for us. And so uh, for our section of Scripture today, I really have two points for you. I'm just going to give them to you right out of the gate. What I think the two main points for us to take away from our text today, the first is this, the gospel frees you from finding meaning in your work. 
The gospel frees you from finding meaning in your work. The second point is that the gospel frees you to find meaning in your work. Those sound like contradictory things, but I think this is exactly what he's talking about. It frees us from finding meaning in our work and frees us to find meaning in our work. Uh, The context here is that Peter has embedded into these people with just a a beautiful first chapter, really chapter 1, 1 through about 2, 3 or so, just this beautiful exposition of what it means to be a child of God to be adopted, to be born again to a living hope, and just all of the precious promises that we get, an inheritance, a father, a hope, a a resurrection to look forward to, a community to belong to, all of the benefits that come from being a child of God, and yet also the challenges of knowing that we actually don't fit in the world like we used to. Um, And so we've got to figure out how to live as elect exiles, chosen of God, and yet not at home. And he applied that last week. He turns a corner in chapter 2 towards applying that to different areas of life. And he starts with our relationship to governing authorities. He explained how a Christian is respond to governing authorities. And it was very timely for us moving into all of the anxieties that come with an election and all the implications that come with that, that ultimately the Christian's plan of survival is to submit to the government out of reverence for Christ. We're to subject ourselves even to ungodly governments because of the king who reigns over all governments. It's because of Jesus' kingship that we can actually, in our freedom in Christ, actually submit. Sounds counterintuitive. It sounds supernatural because it is. Today, we're going to look at his instruction to us that we should subject ourselves even to ungodly masters or employers. And this is, if if we submit to ungodly governments because of Jesus' kingship, we submit to ungodly masters or difficult job situations because we're following Jesus' example. That's going to be the point that he's going to make here. So let's go ahead and read 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25. This is our text today. He says this, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So the title of our message is The Gospel at Work. What does it look like for the gospel to be at work, like literal work? If, uh, if you work 40 hours a week and you work for roughly 40 years, you will spend over 80,000 hours of your life at work. So just think of how significant that is that most of us have to work quite a bit. Maybe some of us are actually going to break the 100,000 barrier, our barrier in our lifetimes. We spend a lot of time at work. It defines a lot of who we are. And it's easy for us to to make two mistakes when it comes to our work. One is to make an idol of our work, looking for our significance and our identity and our purpose in our work, or to be idle at work, as if we don't think it matters, or as if it, uh, it, 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 um, out of discontentment or whatever, and be idle in our work. And I think what we need to look at here is when he talks about servants, we've got a couple things we want to clarify in terms of potential misunderstandings. First, when he's talking about slaves and masters or servants and masters, he's not talking about the same thing that we might think of as Americans, which is American racial slavery from the 17, 1800s. First century slavery was different back then. It wasn't based on race. Often the slaves would be higher educated than their masters. You could sometimes hire someone um, to be a servant, a household servant, to tutor your kids or tutor you. Doctors were sometimes servants. And so we're not talking about exactly a one-for-one here of the kind of slavery that we might think about, masters and slaves, um, in America as it did in the first century. You could end up in slavery for a lot of different reasons. Like perhaps you, your people were at war with another people and you lost, And you could either be annihilated or you could work for the new. And there's all kinds of variety. There's all kinds of varieties of experiences that sometimes 
um, slavery was as severe as American slavery, but a vast majority of it, up to 30% of the empire, was slaves. And so we're just looking like maybe normal employment with maybe a little more, uh, a little more incentive. Um. Second, the scriptures never really approve of slavery. We never just have thou shalt enslave, right? In fact, we have scriptures that tell us, uh, that denounced some of the ugly things that we think about as slavery. And the Old Testament talked a lot about man-stealing, that that was actually punishable by death, to take someone against their will and to enslave them against their will was actually, that, that produced the, the death penalty. You can't steal someone and monetize them. Even the book of Philemon uh, talks about a runaway slave that comes back to his master and goes, you're not to treat him as a lower person, but as a fellow brother. In fact, receive him as you receive me. We see lots of instructions in the New Testament from Ephesians 6 to Colossians 3 to 1 Timothy 6 and Titus 2 about how people ought to conduct themselves in these relationships, these master and slave relationships. It is, to be clear, absolutely wrong and evil. It was wrong and evil for white slave traders and white slave owners to use the Bible to mistreat, exploit, and abuse African slaves, period. That was a misuse of Scripture, not what they're talking about here. Third, we don't live under a slave system anymore, but this text still applies because we all have people that are in authority over us in our work. We all have jobs, and maybe we have different levels of freedom within our job. Maybe for some people, they've signed a contract, and they're more or less enslaved (laughs) uh, for 10 years to meet certain criteria. Maybe some of us are freer. And so actually, I think this text is very relevant to us in our work because we do have people in authority over us, and we do have people that we work for. And these words from Peter tell us, Servants, be subject to your masters, your bosses, your workplace, with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, not only to those who deserve it, but those who don't deserve it, even to the unjust. There's much here that we can learn from, because maybe we all find ourselves in jobs that maybe are not always ideal, or situations that are not always ideal. And Peter is telling us that as Christians, we have a certain way that we conduct ourselves because of Jesus' example. And so we have these two seemingly contradictory statements to begin with, and it's this. The gospel frees you from finding meaning in your work. Frees you from having to make it your identity. That my life is somehow less fulfilling if I didn't have this job, or I feel like I'm stuck in this place. You, You think about those who he's writing to. They are the lowest of the low. Christianity didn't didn't all of a sudden like just take over everything. It moved among the slave class and the poor. Christianity spread in the Roman Empire among very ordinary and even subordinary people. And so he's talking to people who uh, really don't have much choice. Maybe they were born into slavery. They don't really have much that they can do to sort of change their circumstances. And perhaps whatever it is that your father did for a living, that's what you would do. So this idea of, of, um, of, 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 of finding a meaningful vocation that would meet all of my needs is going, actually, the Christian doesn't need that. These, these people that he's writing to can be true Christians and find true contentment and can find true meaning and joy even if their circumstances never change, even if they're under very unjust uh, bosses. They can still be just as fulfilled and find just as much meaning even if their work isn't. So the gospel actually frees us to find meaning outside of our work, to find meaning that we don't have to. It frees us from having to find meaning in our work. He says uh, the word here for servants is oikata, which is household slaves. This is people who are working in ordinary, doing ordinary stuff around the house. Maids and uh, farmers and just household workers. He doesn't say anything in this book about masters. Some, Some writers of the New Testament, Paul sometimes speaks to those who are in charge. But this maybe speaks to the fact that Peter doesn't write to anyone who's actually in authority. Is that the church that he's writing to? Um, in this region, man, it's all just working class people. And maybe you could go just apply it and flip it upside down, but it's just interesting that he writes to people who can be totally, truly Christians even without any sort of power in their vocation, in their government at all. They can be faithful Christians, joyful Christians, fulfilled Christians, even if they don't rise up the ladder. And so he tells them to be subject. The Christian plan here is to be subject. The word subject there is the idea of ordering yourself under for the good, like arranging my life in order that I might be pleasing to my master. So I'm going to go ahead and put forth effort, joyful effort, to sort of organize my labor, to do my best, even for, uh, he says, not just for the good and the gentle, but also for the unjust. He says that we're supposed to do this with all respect, with all reverence. 
And again, not only the good and the gentle, that's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to work well for a good boss. But what do you do when it's not a bad boss? What, what is distinctly Christian about working for an unjust boss? The word for unjust here is literally crooked, a crooked boss. Not just for the good and the gentle, but for the crooked boss, the one who takes advantage of you, that mistreats you, that doesn't really value what you're doing. What does it mean to be an elect exile, a hopeful exile, when your work situation is less than ideal? I think what he's going to tell us is that our conduct is not based on who they are, but who you are in Christ. Your response to them is all about who you are in Christ and not what kind of boss they are. That's the defining reality for the Christian, is that I'm defined by Christ, by my Lord, by my King, by the example that's set before me. In verse 19, he, he gives these promises. He gives it at the beginning of verse 19, at the end of verse 20, which is sort of this bookend here. He says, this is a gracious thing. When you are mistreated or you're in a job that doesn't appreciate you, it is a gracious thing when you, mindful of God, is that what it says? Mindful of God, endure sorrows and suffering while unjustly. It's a gracious thing, meaning gift. God, God is pleased and rewards that kind of situation. That when you're thinking of God, you're, you're looking at your tough work situation, this thing that doesn't feel fair, that's overwhelming, and you look at it and you go, wait, I need to think about God, and therefore I'm going to respond in a Christ-like way. God goes, I see that. I see that, and I'm going to reward that. I'm going to put that on your pay stub, right? You're going to be well compensated for your faithfulness there. I see the injustice, and I'm going to pay it back. And then he, he goes on to say, for this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows for suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you are sin and you are beaten for it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's just justice, right? But if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing. He just doubles it down in the sight of God. So when you're thinking beyond just your work situation and the task that's in front of you and the unpleasantness of it, you're going, God is watching. I want to please him. And you just get it backed up with going, God is watching. He sees it, and he'll reward you. He just, just double, double, makes the same point twice there. Be from beginning to end, I want the approval of God. So here's, here's the reality. Here's sort of the counterintuitive thing is that Christians are free. Because of the blood of Christ, we are free. And we exercise our freedom by submitting ourselves, which sounds so counterintuitive, right? As Americans, we're free. Don't tread on me. You walk in my house without announcing, you're going to get shot, right? Like freedom, right? But no, the freedom here that he's talking about is true freedom in Christ is willing to then submit myself even to those who are ungodly. Sounds weird. Sounds Sounds unnatural. Well, that's because it's supernatural. So we're free. Christians are free from finding their identity in their work. They're free from having to feel like work is really working, is, uh, is, uh, is really fulfilling. They're free from that. Galatians 3, 27 and 28 says, For as many as you were baptized into Christ, you've been united with him, you've followed him in obedience, you, you've put on Christ. Verse 28, There is no Jew or Greek, there is no slave or free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Your earthly standing, as low and as mistreated as it may be, is not the ultimate reality. And so now you can willingly serve and submit and even endure injustice and unfulfillment, knowing that ultimately that's not my identity. I don't have to take it to heart. It doesn't have to be my reality your work doesn't have to be fulfilling or pleasant. That's somewhat encouraging. That sounds maybe a little discouraging at first, but then you go, oh, actually, it doesn't have to be for me to be a happy, contented person. In the first century, you didn't have vocational choice. We have the ability to, often, we have options available to us that we could pursue better alignment with our career, and that's great, but it's not required. We could live our whole life doing very ordinary things and never get noticed and still be a joyful, fruitful Christian that God rewards on the last day. That's so freeing. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7, 17. He says something very similar. He says, Only let a person lead the life that the Lord has assigned him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. That if you can just stay where you are, just stay where you are. Right? He goes on in verse 20. Each one of you should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. Then he gives this parenthesis, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. So you are free to just remain where you are. And you are free that if you have the opportunity to find something that works better, you're free, right? What a freedom. 
to just walk through whatever doors God opens and to be totally content if he doesn't open another door the rest of your life. How free you really are. Verse 22, for he, is, for he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a free man to the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each one was called, let him remain with God. Right? You see, just, just see that deep contentedness that all of a sudden goes, my job doesn't have to be my identity anymore. So the Christian can and must be content and faithful in all situations. You can be faithful and joyful in any job that isn't requiring you to sin. You're free in Christ to just serve him in whatever he's placed you. God gives special grace and special honor to those who are in harder situations. He sees, he sees your good conduct even when it's overlooked by others, and he has special grace and honor. He goes, I see you. That's going to pay off. I guarantee you. Keep, keep at it. We are not owed, or should we expect to get the ideal job or boss? God may be glorified in us doing the unpleasant thing for the unpleasant person, for God's sake, right? In fact, a Christian might intentionally seek out the lowest, hardest, most demeaning position pr- precisely because the goal isn't personal fulfillment, but the commendation of God, right? Uh, I mean, Jesus talks about that, right? The one who is greatest among you is the one who serves. Remember, he, he, the, the disciples, nobody wants to wash feet. So Jesus has washed feet and goes, actually, that's the honored position. The one who knows that God is watching, God's ultimately the one who compensates us for our work. And so I'm going to take the lowest level. I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm not going to post on Facebook that I did the thing that nobody wanted to do. And I'm just going to be content with serving the Lord. What a freedom that is to, to actually intentionally take the most demeaning job. In the church, in our home, this doesn't just apply to our work and our jobs. This applies to being at home. This applies to the stay-at-home mom and the, you know, working in your neighborhood, volunteering in your church. I'll take the lowest position because I know and I am free and I'm secure. And God sees and God rewards. In Philippians, Paul talks about being in prison. And here's what he says in Philippians 4, 11 through 12, or 11 and through 13. Maybe you've heard this verse before says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. I've been on both ends of the spectrum. I've been at the top of the heap. I've been at the bottom of the heap. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty. That's a challenge. When you have more than you need, sounds like a good challenge. Some of us would like to have that challenge. But it is a challenge. And I know what it's like to be in hunger, abundance and need, And here's the thing, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So does this mean we should overlook abusive masters or injustices? Well, I think there's a little bit of a yes and no. Yes, we endure without seeking personal vengeance. I'm not looking to just champion my rights all the time and pay people back for every injustice. So yes, there should be, I think, a disposition to be able to just endure and absorb without seeking personal vengeance. But I think we'd also say no, we don't want to overlook abuse because Peter said in just the previous verses we looked at last week that God has designed governments to promote good and to punish evil. And so when an employer, a parent, someone is breaking the law, then we are, it is right for us to do justice, not in order to bring vengeance ourselves, but to let God's designed instruments to restrain evil and promote good to work out their plan. So where is justice found? Ultimately, it's God on Judgment Day. But presently, God has put authorities in place, and we're fortunate that in our country, for the most part, we don't have a perfect system by by any means, but if you go to just about any other country where there's much more corruption, we are to use the God-ordained mechanisms, like he said in in 1 Peter 2.14, that these governing authorities are sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So if we must report evil, we report it, not out of a sense of vengeance and justice, uh, in and of itself, for, or for ourselves, but for the sake of redemption. So I think the default setting for every Christian is to endure for good and work for God's pleasure, but there are exceptions and there are limits to those things. But I think those exceptions are best worked out from the foundation of the Christian of being willing to endure. I'm willing to endure and, and absorb what's unjust as far as I can 
with gracious endurance, and then working out the exceptions from that disposition. Does that make sense? I do think that's what he's talking about here. So here's the good, here's, here's the good news, friends. Your first thought does not have to be, I need to find a job that fulfills me. I'm free from that. If I find one, great. That's icing on the cake. But that's not necessary to my happiness or necessary to me serving God. I don't have to go in and go, I deserve to be treated better. Those aren't actually my first thoughts. My first thoughts are, is my conduct gracious in God's sight? Am I being mindful of God in my action, my speech, and my attitude? And what does God think as he sees me do my work? That's the first thought for a Christian. Those other questions can be useful, but they're downstream from a deep disposition of being contented where God has us. So Christian, the gospel has made you free from finding meaning in your work, from making it an idol, from thinking that it has to be the thing that satisfies me, that it's the source of my joy and my peace. And I'm free from that. God may actually have you in the exact job that he wants you to be in, right? Your faithfulness might be best displayed right exactly where you are, and you might be in the most profitable place for his kingdom right now. You just may not see it. Ed Clowney, he says this. He's a commentator, theologian. He says, unjust treatment offers a golden opportunity to show the uniqueness of Christian service. By patiently enduring unmerited abuse, they show the opposite of a servile attitude. They actually demonstrate their Christian freedom. That's amazing. That's so counterintuitive. So I don't have to keep the justice score. God is. And God's going to square things up. He's going to exact better vengeance and justice than I could. And he's going to compensate better than my boss does for my good work. Right? How free are we as Christians? Not only that, the gospel also frees us to find meaning in our work, whatever it may be. So the gospel frees us from having to make work our idol. right? But it also frees us to know that our work can matter, no matter what it is. The gospel frees you to find meaning in your work. Look at verse 21. He says, to this you have been called. How many of us are wondering, what is our calling? What's my calling? Right? What is God calling me to? What's, what's, and we tend to think of, what are you called to be? Sometimes we ask, ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? What's the job or the thing or the thing that's just really going to make you um, profitable? And it's just fascinating that that's not the direction that Peter goes is to a certain job. He says, to this you've been called. This is your calling, that because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. You want to know what your calling, your vocational calling is? To be like Jesus wherever you're working, at home, in your job, wherever. That's your calling. Not necessarily a particular job, although God may guide you that direction. Not necessarily a particular career or working for a particular company, Those may or may not be part of it, but ultimately Christ's likeness, Christ's example is your calling. That's your job in the kingdom, is Christ's likeness. Part of that Christ's likeness is that you're called to suffering in your vocation, in your job. Suffering. Yay! If we put that on a job description. Number one, suffer unjustly. Who's signing up for that job? But the pay is so good. Well, if the pay is good enough, I'll endure some suffering, right? That's exactly what being a Christian is, is that when you become a Christian, you sign up for suffering. Mark 8, 34 through 37, here's what Jesus says. He says, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And think about taking up a cross. That's a, that's a torture implement. That's an execution device. Take up your electric chair. Take up your hangman's noose, right? Take up your instrument of death and follow me deny yourself your desires your fulfillment all of that submitted put to death in a brutal way and come follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul for what can a man give in return for his soul right what if you gain just the most fulfilling job ever but lose your soul what a disaster that would be right So being in a job that always is a breeze every day, never demands perseverance, never requires you to overcome evil and mistreatment, that actually, working in that job, doesn't say anything about the power of the gospel. Who wouldn't be happy and productive in a job perfectly calibrated to them? 
That doesn't demonstrate Jesus in any way. Anyone, even without Christ and the Holy Spirit, would be able to do a job that's just uniquely designed according to all of their desires. But what if the difficulty and the endurance, the suffering, is part of the job of a Christian? And so actually that is where the gospel then shows up, when it is difficult and there is suffering. And then he goes, Peter goes, and makes his argument to go, hey, here's the example Christ set for you. This is your calling to follow him. And the way you follow him is by embracing suffering with joy. And just think of the job description that the Messiah had in Isaiah chapter 53. This is the job, right? That someone had to sign up in order for Christians, in in order for people who are far from God, who are under his wrath, under his judgment, the only way for sinners, the job at hand, the job that needs to be accomplished is that sinners need to be reconciled to their God. Is there anyone qualified to step into this job and do what is required to bring sinners back to a holy God? And Isaiah chapter 53 tells us, we read it earlier, that it was going to have to take someone who is perfect, a God-man, someone without sin. So that disqualifies all of us for this job, right? And they're going to suffer. In fact, I'll just go ahead and read it again. Listen to this. This is what... According to the scriptures, this is part of why your Old Testament is so long. This is just to show you, you cannot earn salvation from God. You just cannot be righteous enough. You have too much of a sin problem. Even your good deeds are tainted with your own selfishness. So here's the job description that is needed for this job to get done. It says this, Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken from the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. It was the will of the Lord to crush him and to put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in the land. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So just think of the job that needed to be done to bring sinners to God. And Jesus signed up for that job. He signed up for that job. He applied and was approved. He was qualified. He was the only one who was qualified. And Jesus was born of a virgin, brought into the word, kept the law perfectly, lived a perfect sinless life, was reversing the curse by healing people and defeating demons, and then In order to complete the job, he went to the cross, and he took the hell that you and I deserve upon himself. And on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Let them off. Then he died, and he rose again. And anyone who would repent of their sins and put their trust in him get the benefits of what he's done, which is a new relationship with God, forgiveness of sins. And so Peter goes there. When Peter is thinking about you and the difficulties of your job, he can't help but go to the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul is talking about marriage, he all of a sudden like forgets about marriage for a second and talks about Christ in the church, right? He looks past the physical reality to the greater reality that's possible if Christians will live in the power of Christ. And here he says, in your unjust situation, whatever it might be, where you're getting overlooked and mistreated, there's an opportunity for the gospel to shine there because Jesus shined. He says this in, in 1 Peter 2, verse 22, back to our text. He committed no sin, nor nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So when he's thinking about these Christians that are in difficult work situations, He can't help but go, this sounds like Isaiah 53. You've signed up for the job to play the gospel out in front of people. God, Jesus left you an example and the power to actually live out the gospel at work. 
One commentator says, in representing Isaiah 53, Peter provides three points. He says, one, Jesus was innocent and did not retaliate. Number two, Jesus accomplished redemption for sin. And number three, before coming to faith in Jesus, the reader was also in a life-threatening situation like a sheep without a shepherd. Think of what Jesus did. He got the job done and brought you to God. You were straying from him. You were mocking him. You were living in rebellion against him, and he came and got you. So think about that in your job. Think about that in your assignments. Jesus' whole job, his whole calling, was to be a substitutionary sacrifice. He said this to his disciples in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's my job. That's my calling. And for those that have embraced Jesus as King and Lord and Savior, just follow him on that same way to give our lives as a ransom for many. I love what Tim Keller says. He says, all true love is substitutionary sacrifice. If you really love someone, you're giving and sacrificing for their good with joy. Jesus did that for us, and so now we get the opportunity to do that for in whatever place God has put us. We can now follow in his steps. Literally, when it talks about following in his steps, it's it's like tracing the lines. Do you remember in school? They've got like the, the cursive letters, and I don't know if anybody writes in cursive anymore, but you got, the, you got the thing up there, right? And in order to learn how to write the letters properly, what do you have to do? You trace them, right? And they give you these worksheets, and you trace it until you get an A just right. You get a B just right, and you get a C just right. It's, that's the idea here, is that Jesus has left us a pattern. We can go to Isaiah chapter 53 and just trace it and go, that's the attitude I should have. That's the way I should respond to reviling. That is how I should respond in the different situations that I'm in. That's how I should work. That should be my disposition. We just trace him with our lines. Just trace him. Just trace what he's doing. The reality is, is that we begin up treating our bosses or our families or our companies better than they deserve because Jesus treated us better than we deserve. Jesus says this in Mark, in Luke chapter 6. He says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? That doesn't display the gospel at all. Anyone can do the transaction thing. For even sinners love those who love them. Yeah, it's just a you scratch my back, I scratch yours, right? Like, that's just survival of the fittest, right? I mean, there's nothing supernatural about that. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? I mean, the most evil people in the world do that, right? Even sinners do the same, verse 34. But if you lend to those whom you expect, uh, if, if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But here's what's different about you as a supernatural person, as an elect exile, as a child of the king. Love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. Your boss will see it. He will compensate you. Right? And you will be sons of the Most High God, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Us. He was kind and un- to us. We were the ungrateful. We were the evil until we came to know Christ. And so we put that Mercy out there too. Verse 36, be merciful even as your father is merciful. So here, let me land the plane here because some have to catch an airplane here soon. Here's just a few kind of takeaways or reasons why suffering is more fulfilling than the perfect dream job. Number one, when you're doing that, when you're living out what Peter's talking about in the power of the gospel, you are experiencing a smaller version of what Christ experienced for you. And I think this increases your worship and gratitude to God. That when life's not going the way you want and you're bearing an unjust burden, you go, wait, that's what Christ bore for me. He deserves my worship and my gratitude. John Piper says our vocation in the world is to suffer unjustly. It's our job and our calling. We understand a little bit more about our own salvation and what God has done for us when we experience that and respond rightly. Number two, You're becoming a little bit more like Jesus every day. You're getting a little bit better at tracing those lines. Every injustice, every wrong, everything that's overlooked, you're learning to trace those lines. And every time you do it, you get a little bit better. So actually, adversity, difficulty, heartbreak comes, and we see it as an opportunity to actually become more like Jesus. This increases our sanctification and our holiness in God because we're actually getting an opportunity to write the letters again. With every bit of suffering, with every bit of heartbreak, we get an opportunity to become a little bit more like Jesus, to follow in his path, to get that cross settled nice and uncomfortable on our shoulders as we carry it. 
Number three, you're honoring Jesus by following his example. You, you are honoring Jesus by following his example. You're a true Christian because you're responding like he responded. And you know that's not coming from your flesh. That's coming from the Spirit. And maybe it's not easy. Maybe you're wrestling with it. But you're honoring him. And you're confirming your own, the truth of who you really are. This increases your reward and honor before God. One pastor says, you may not get your credit before men, but you will certainly get your reward from God. And again, another pastor says, when you go against your own nature and repay evil with good, you show that there is something supernatural going on in the moment. That's not natural, that's supernatural. Number four, you are portraying the Christ role in the unfolding drama of your workplace. You are getting to play the Christ role. We know that in marriage, in Ephesians chapter 5, that Peter tells us, or not Peter, Paul tells us, that in some respects, in marriage, the man gets to play the Christ role by laying down his life for his bride. And the wife gets to play the Christ role by submitting herself just as the, fa- the son from submitted himself to the father. We both get to portray an aspect of Christ in marriage. We both get a role. One's not greater than the other. Both together show. And also, the wife gets to picture what Christ is to the church, or what the church is to Christ. So there's, there's things going on here, right? We both get an important role, and when you face unjust suffering, you get an opportunity to portray Christ in your workplace. The unfolding drama, all of a sudden the gospel has a chance to kind of break through because how are you going to respond? And this increases the attractiveness and believability of, the, of God and his gospel. Your vocation, especially when it's hard, is a stage for the gospel drama to play out, a platform for God to be glorified. He will see it and he will reward it. You will enjoy him more. He will, you will display him more. You will share him more when your response is so different than what people would expect in an unjust situation. We get the distinct privilege of playing the Christ role, of embracing suffering, of enduring evil for the good of another. To endure evil for the sake of another, that they might experience mercy and grace. You're never more like God than when you return evil for good, mercy for sin, grace for wickedness. Number five, you are joining Jesus in returning straying sheep to their shepherd. You are joining Jesus in returning straying, because he ends in a very strange place. You once were straying like sheep, but because Jesus responded the way he did, you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And I think when we respond, I think the implication is when we respond that way, we put that on display. And God uses our endurance and our faithfulness and our graciousness. He uses that to then draw people who are running from the shepherd, draws them back. They now understand a little bit of what he's like because they've met one of his ambassadors. Colossians 1.24, I like what Paul says here. This sounds really weird, uh, but I think it's part of what we're talking about here. Colossians 1.24, he's like, I I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's sufferings, afflictions for the sake of the body, that is the church. Now that sounds like heresy. Paul is saying, is he saying that Christ's sufferings are insufficient to save people? That's not what he's saying. He is saying that people have a hard time seeing and believing it until they see a Christian suffer. So actually, there is some additional suffering that's still needed so that when people see Jesus' suffering, they know what it means. Does that make sense? So there's nothing else needed to save you than Jesus' sufferings and his victory. But in order for that good message to get to people in a way that they hear and understand, God has ordained that his people suffer in order that people might see and understand Christ's sufferings. He's like, there is more suffering for me to share in, Paul says, because there's still more work that the gospel needs to do kind of through me. So it's not saying that Jesus' afflictions and sufferings are insufficient, but that God has ordained that through the sufferings of his people, they might get out to the world and might benefit. I hope I explained that well. Bottom line, your difficulties at work are really about enjoying, displaying, and sharing the gospel of God. When it aligns and when it doesn't, you respond in a way that honors God. Let's bow and let's pray, and let's just respond. If, you've not, if you're not a Christian, then you really have no place to go but your work <laughs> to find your identity. And what a terrible place to sit, something that can be so easily taken from you. But if you have turned from your sin and put your trust in Christ, then you can anchor your identity, your hope, your salvation in something otherworldly 
that allows you to live in this world with such hope and such peace, regardless if everything else is taken away from you. So I encourage you to come to faith in Jesus Christ today and, ex- and receive this hope that sounds so peculiar. And if you have this hope, lean into it. Ask God right now. I'll give you just a moment uh, to just pray and respond in your own heart however God is leading you to. But maybe you need to. Maybe you've just been uncomfortable with some things going on. Just rest in the Lord. That this is part of his plan. He sees and he rewards, he comforts. And so let me just give you a moment to respond how the Lord is leading you. Let me share this prayer from Francis of Assisi many centuries ago. I think it fits here. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Oh God, we do come before you, and this in many ways is a very hard word, uh, that you might call us to just stay in hard and unfair situations, that we might to some extent never feel quite at home in the work that you've given us, Lord, so help us to embrace that and also embrace the better news that comes behind it, that because of what you have done for us, we really are free from having to sort of make something of ourselves to try to get our own way or to feel comfortable all the time. And we thank you at the same time that you've given us a calling to trace your steps, to walk in your example, And we thank you that by doing that, we come to know you more. And other people come to know you more, too. We thank you for that great privilege. Help us to lean into it. Help us to understand it. Give us patience and grace. Let us help one another live into the calling that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We do want to come to the Lord's table now. Um, And we come to the Lord's table, uh, and it has been prepared for us. We didn't work for it. We didn't earn our place at this table. Christ has given it to us. He's the one that accomplished it. We didn't provide a relationship with God for ourselves. We don't deserve to be at his table. But it is. It's a table of acceptance. It's a table of nourishment. It's a table of remembrance and a table of gratitude that we come, not on our own merits, but because we've put our faith in Christ. He has purchased the elements. He actually gives himself to us, right? This is my body. This is my blood. So we come with the empty hands of faith, knowing that we don't deserve to be here, and yet we deserve to be here because of Christ. Not because of our own merits, but because of what he has done for us. So if you've come to turn from your sin and put your faith in Christ, then you're welcome to partake with us in glad obedience. We come together and remember, and we receive what he has freely given. And what we remember is that before the suffering of Christ was an example for us, it was something done to purchase us. It was something done for us before it became an example to us. Christ did really bear our sins on the cross and really did set us free. So I'll give you just a moment to, to pray. There'll be some soft music playing. And when you're ready, come and grab cracker and juice and sit back down. I'll lead us in taking it together. If you're not a believer, then just watch what's going on. Um, if you're just not in a spot where you're like, I just don't think I'm in a spot where I should take this, that's totally fine. We want to take this rightly. Um, and so... Uh, I'll give you just a moment for the Lord to prepare your hearts. And when you're ready, come get the elements, sit back down, I'll lead us in taking them together.
to be able to partake of the Lord's Supper together. Jesus gave us two ordinances, uh, physical practices that help kind of enact our salvation, help make it real for us, and, and baptism and the Lord's Supper are those two. And so it is a distinct privilege. We're joining with Christians around the world and down through the ages uh, as part of the body of Christ and partaking of these elements together. So this is a sacred thing that we're doing together. Here's what Paul says. He says, I received, sorry, we're all out. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for taking care of me. I just can't turn the snark off. You know? For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. To, oh, I skipped a spot. Sorry. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow and pray one more time. Oh, God, we thank you for this ordinance. We thank you for this practice that you've given us to remind us that we belong to you. That you have purchased us by your body and your blood and now you nourish us in that same gospel that you purchased. You nourish us. And we thank you for giving us physical symbols like this to remind us, to help make the spiritual reality more tactile uh, to us. And we thank you for gathering a body of believers here together to, to celebrate in this way. And Lord, we pray and ask for your help to be what you've called us to, to be, to be servants in this world, both to the good and the gentle and also to the unjust, because we know that you see and you reward and that you're actually using that mistreatment to not only sanctify us, but to proclaim your gospel and make it believable and to get it in places that, um, that maybe it would never get if we didn't 
uh, embrace the cross, embrace the suffering. So Lord, help us to have joy in whatever season and circumstance of life and help us to love and serve you, uh, whatever that takes, whatever it costs. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and let's sing in Christ alone. Amen. Uh, thanks for being here today, for singing, for listening so intently, uh, for fellowshipping with one another. If you want to know more about, I found this book helpful, The Gospel at Work. So if any of you want to just dig in deeper on how to, uh, how to live out your Christian faith in your workplace, especially when it's difficult, there's good resources that I can point your direction. Also, if you have any questions about becoming a Christian or more about our church, baptism, any of this stuff, any of the things that were in the message, I'd be happy to help you in any way that I can. Make sure you talk with one another as well. There's a lot of wisdom and experience in this room, and so make sure you avail yourself of the community of the church, uh, not just the services. If you've got uh, Connect and Prayer cards, make sure to fill those out. You can put those in the box in the back or give them to me. Uh, there's free resources in the back, too. If anything looks interesting, you can take it. Um, and uh, we do have prayer walking at North Middle School at 3 p.m. We have work days Wednesday and Saturday. 
Um, and so I just want to highlight those things. But you're ready for lunch. Let me give you a benediction. Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord, our God, be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Uh, establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen? Go in peace.